All right, I'm uh, going to start. I'm going to talk a uh, little bit about uh, left heart catheterization, left ventriculography, um, in geographic assessment of valvular disease with some examples. And um, I will also show some hemodynamic case discussion. Okay, so it will be kind of a mixed talk. So uh, I will start with this. And I'm, going, I'm showing an LV gram. And what do you see on that LV gram? I must tell you that the echo on this patient showed normal EF, no segmental wall motion abnormality. Anything interesting on that echo, on that uh, LV gram, I mean? Um, let's see, uh, let's pick um, Thor. What is interesting on that echo, on that LV gram? Do you see anything? I thought I had a four here. Huh? Uh, yes. To me, it looks like the basal segments of the heart are moving more than the apex. Uh, it is true because the apex has a problem. Yeah. The apex is. Oh, has a, has, has a aneurysm there or? A kinetic, this kinetic. Oh, it's yeah. a slightly dyskinetic, definitely a kinetic. So it's moving opposite to the rest because it's fully a kinetic and it's being pushed paradoxically during systole. Okay. So there is apical is a kinesis with a slight dyskinesis that was missed on echo, which is not unusual because the very distal apex on echo may be, is frequently missed or foreshortened on echo. And so they may cut through here on echo and they will miss the true apical abnormality. So it's not unusual. There is something else too here. Anybody, if some, I don't know if someone else can see it. I was thinking, is it, is it, is it like a, a aneurysm there or? or no. Or a, is, it, is, a, is a clot? Clot. A thrombus. There is a thrombus. I wouldn't call it aneurysm just to tell you aneurysm, just the difference between, between dyskinesis and aneurysm. Aneurysm means you have a bulging pocket both in systole and diastole. It bulges furthermore in systole, but, it bulge, but it's bulging throughout systole and diastole. This one is not bulging in diastole. It only bulges when the remaining wall contract and push it out. So it only bulges in systole. This is what we call dyskinesis. Um, it's not severe dyskinesis in this case, it's mild dyskinesis, but it's not aneurysm, just to be clear. That said, it's still um, in, in, you know, a very significant finding. It's indicative of an old apical infarct. Uh, although dyskinesis per se may just be also ongoing ischemia. It does not have to be uh, non-viable um, myocardium and infarct, uh, or, or non-viable infarct, uh, myocardium and, um, you know, old infarct. It could be also acute ischemia. We see it. It could be reversible. I don't think it is in this case because it's a clearly chronic and you see apical thrombus. That's the important finding here. That was totally missed on echo. This patient had a distally occluded LAD with absolutely no collateral. In retrospect, this territory is an indication in this particular patient of an old infarct with non-viable myocardium. But again, this kinesis is not always a non-viable myocardium. Aneurysm is a non-viable myocardium, but this kinesis doesn't have to be. It could be reversible. So I just wanted to show that, show this is a value of an LV gram. So this is what an LV gram does. This was an RAO view of an LV gram. This is again the view of the heart in the chest. This is RAO and this is LAO. Very important to distinguish. RAO is looking in this direction and it shows you, and this, these are the LV wall. Remember, this is a 2D imaging. We're just seeing the edges. We don't see what's, we don't see the edges of what's on the inside. So we only see the edges of the border of the heart shadow. So when you look in RAO view, you will see the anterior wall you won't see the septum because the septum is lower than the anterior wall. 
You see the anterior wall as, an, as a superior edge. You see the apex very well, and that's the best thing about REO view, the apex. It's actually even better than echo. That's about the only place where LVGRAM is better than echo, apex. You also see the inferior diaphragmatic wall. This is RCA, this is LAD. You do not see too well the septum. You do not see well what we call the posterolateral, that area hidden in the back of the heart, the circumflex area, you do not see it. So you see well LAD and PDA specifically, LAD and PDA. I, I had in my interventional uh, board recertification, they showed me an alvigram with an, you know, dyskinetic inferior wall and they wanted me to identify which artery. It's the PDA specifically, it's not PLB. So PLB and circumflex are not well seen. Septum is not very well seen. So this is what RAO does. It splits ventricular area and atrial area, okay? If you have a VSD, you're not going to see it well because, or you know, you will see something, but it's hard to see it well because this view superimposes RV and LV, okay? Now, LAO, on the other hand, it looks in this direction. It's like the apical four chamber in echo. So you split left and right. You can see the left ventricle on one side, right ventricle. Of course, we don't normally see the right ventricle when we're injecting the left, but you can see the shadow of it, okay? Another note in RAO view, it's not important, but what you see mostly is the posterior mitral leaflet, which in this particular, from this particular angle engulfs the anterior leaflet, okay? So uh, this is an LAO view. So this was an REO, this is an LAO view. This is an LAO straight. The problem LAO straight is not great. It kind of overlaps a lot of things. It overlaps the septum with the apex and the anterior wall but it does show the lateral wall. So LAO view, unlike REO, it will show you that posterolateral circumflex infarct. Somebody's having an acute circumflex infarct and you do an LV gram, you may miss that posterolateral akinesis. LAO view will show it. We don't do LAO view routinely, but I just, you, I just want you to be aware of that. Now, in order to improve LAO view, if you look from here, you will overlap septum and anterior wall. But if you look LAO from above, then you get the best spread of the LV, septum, and lateral wall. And the best spread also of the RV, should you happen to have a communication between the LV and the RV, okay? It also opens very well the LA, the LV, LA. Unlike the LAO, straight view, which can overlap LV, LA. That's again, important in case you're having MR. This will be important in case you have VSD, VSR, ventricular septal rupture, okay? It's a classic board question that they will show you an LV gram with filling of the right ventricle, and that will be a VSD. It's harder to identify that on an REO view. I do want you to know that we don't do those very often here, but you will use them in EP a lot. You will use that swinging between LAO, RAO, and EP. You just need to understand um, what ventricle you're looking at and what chamber you're looking at. Um, so this is an example. This is an LV gram in an RAO view. And you see here a retrograde feeling. It's not a playing image. It's not a film, but still you can see the delineation of a huge left atrium, okay? So this is indicative of, as you can imagine, a severe mitral regurgitation, okay? Now there is a technique to prove mitral regurgitation. I want to tell you that uh, you need to know, or even though we don't talk much about it, left ventriculogram is an excellent modality to, to assess regurgitant valvular disease. Uh, particularly cases that are indeterminate by echo. It's because it is a volumetric assessment. It's a qualitative, but it's volumetric assessment. Unlike echo, which assesses Doppler, which can fade if it is an eccentric Doppler flow, it can fade and you can underestimate the significant of a regurgitation by echo. By LV gram, 
you know, you're less likely to have that because even if you have an eccentric flow, it doesn't matter because it's a volumetric assessment. Uh, qualitative, but volumetric. You have to do it properly. So I'm going to give you a hint about how to do an LV gram on your suspecting MR and how to do an iortogram on your suspecting AI and then get your best answer. So one, in order to do it properly, or before I tell you that, I'm just going to give you the criteria of what we call severe MR by LV gram, okay? Anybody knows what's, uh, how do we call it severe MR by LV gram? Maybe a second year fellow. So the filling of the left atrium will be more dense than the LV. Okay, that's a very important idea. So yes, the filling of the left atrium will be at least as dense as the LV, okay? So there are four grades, one plus to four plus. One plus is you just see a whiff of contrast. Two plus, you see contrast filling the LA, but it's not equal to the LV. Three plus, the LA fills fully, and it is equal in filling to the LV. Four plus, the LA fills stronger than the LV. I have it here, okay? So four plus, the LA fills more strongly than the LV, or it fills within one cardiac cycle as strong as the LV. So it either fills more than the LV or as strong as the LV, but very quickly within one cardiac cycle. Or you see the pulmonary veins. This is four plus. But by the way, severe MR is a three plus. Four plus is very severe MR. So the surgical indication is a three plus when the LE, LA is as fully opacified as the LV, okay? Now there is a catch though when we're doing when we're doing this. Um, that what I'm saying indicates that one, you need very good filling. You need very good filling of the LV, you need very good filling of the LA. And keep in mind in patients with severe MR, you may have a huge LA. Okay, so in order to fill it, you have to give a large volume of contrast. Okay, that's one. Two, you need to open the LA. When uh, what you see in the standard REO view, you see the ascending aorta and the descending aorta is normally here in a normal REO view. So ascending and descending here. So the descending aorta is overlapped with the LA normally. So it will be hard to um, it, it, it will be hard to describe how opacified the LA is because the descending aorta is overlapped with it. So here are the technical hints to uh, get a good LV gram. You need to do a steep REO. So regular REO will get you here. The REO that we do normally is 30 degrees. The descending aorta will be here. So you do more extreme REO, something like 50, like I say here, 50, 60 degrees. And then the descending aorta will be spread out further away you see in this image, I don't see the descending aorta, or you see it here, this is the catheter and the descending aorta, femoral axis. So the descending aorta is spread out in a way that you see the full extent on the, of the LA and you can assess your MR. So that's one hint. The second hint is to give a big injection. Normally for left ventriculogram, uh, I don't know if you know how much we inject. Normally I don't inject much, depending on, the size of the left ventricle, I can inject a total volume of anywhere between 18 to 30 milliliters. So not much of a volume. Uh, but when I have MR, you almost have to double it. I typically give something like 50 milliliters, total volume 13 milliliters per second. So I give a big and sustained volume to allow me to see that filling of the left atrium, okay? One other caveat to keep in mind with this classification, when the LA is, you may have stages where the LA is bigger than the LV. And in those cases, it's very hard to have a four plus. It's very hard to have an LA more dense than the LV simply because it's larger in size than the LV. So even if you have equal regurgitant volume, even if you have a 50% regurgitant volume, it will be diluted in a bigger chamber 
So that contrast, that 50% will be diluted in a bigger chamber, so it will be less opacified than the LV. So keep that in mind when you have a very big LA, it could be severe with uh, maybe a little less opacification of the LA than the LV when you have a picture like this. So keep that in mind. Uh, so in this view, you can see the MR is severe. One, the LA is a huge, but that's not uh, enough to define, of course, severe MR. It supports it. The other important thing you see, is, you see is that they are opacified equally, despite the fact that the LA is bigger than the LV. That gives you an extra point in a way, because again, like I said, it's harder to opacify an LA that's bigger than the LV. Another thing is you see the left upper pulmonary vein filling here, and that's an indicator of a four plus, okay? So those are some ideas. Uh, another thing, you know, general idea with all LV gram, you want the catheter to be properly positioned. You don't want the catheter to be stuck. When we're entering the uh, LV through the aorta, the catheter may get stuck in the papillary muscles and cordae. You should never inject when the catheter is stuck there. One, you can perforate the ventricle. Two, you create a fake MR because you're injecting all your volume in the cordae. So uh, you should never do that and you're not going to get a good LV gram. So you may have to make sure your catheter is free and it's normally in the middle of the LV cavity, okay? So those are general hints. Another idea is you have to avoid ectopy. So it has to be in the middle of the cavity, free, not in the base, stuck in the cordae, not in the apex where you get a lot of ectopy. Uh, I'm going to give you another case. Is anybody has, does anybody have questions about this? All right, I'm going to give you another case. This is a 48 year old man. He's referred for chest pain. He has had murmur for decades. On exam, he has a low, loud mid systolic murmur and a hollow diastolic murmur at the left and right upper sternal border with attenuated A2. So mid systolic and hollow diastolic murmur. Blood pressure is 150 over 70, pulse is 60. Echo shows a bicuspid aortic valve with eccentric AI that is read as moderate with mild AS. LV is mildly dilated, EF is 45%, and the aortic sinuses are dilated at 4.4 centimeters. So what is the next step here? I, I, you know, I want to hint, give you a few hints here. One, when you hear hollow diastolic murmur, what does this suggest? MR? Severity of the RTI. No, it's hollow diastolic. AI. 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 But what else does it suggest about that AI? So if it's hollow diastolic, it means that it's probably severe. Yes. It's a very important, it's not how loud it is necessarily, but it's when it is hollow diastolic, whenever you hear that term, it is uh, highly specific for severe AI, severe chronic AI. Normally in acute AI, it's not hollow diastolic simply because you get equalization of pressure between aorta and LV in mid diastole. So in acute AI, you may not get hollow diast. In acute severe AI, it may not be hollow diastolic. But in chronic severe AI, it is a hollow diastolic murmur. And the finding of this is highly specific for severe AI. So whenever you hear that, be highly suspicious of severe AI and worry that the echo may have missed something. Another thing, the pulse pressure is wide. In a 48 year old man, pulse pressure is wide, meaning one simple definition is the systolic pressure more than double the pulse pressure. Okay, the pulse pressure here is, or I apologize, I mean, the pulse pressure is more than half the systolic. So the pulse pressure is 80. It's more than half the systolic pressure, 150. So, so this patient has a wide pulse pressure at the age of 48. It makes no sense. That's another hint. Another hint is that echo frequently underestimate eccentric jet, whether AI or MR. You also have other hints. The LV is dilated, EF is low not clearly why, so that all that fit. 
So this is a great case to do an aortogram here. And this is the aortogram that we did. So again, this is not LV gram, this is aortogram, but so, and here I want you to notice this. One, you're seeing the LV, it's the same classification as MR, okay? Except here we're comparing the aorta to the receiving cham chamber, the LV. So what you can see here, you see the ventricle filling as much as the aorta. Don't look at the cusp. Our catheter, a pigtail catheter is stuck in the right, in the cusp here. So that area will be more dense than the rest. But look at the aorta and compare it to the, the ascending aorta and compare it to the ventricle. The left ventricle is at least as dense as the ascending aorta. Importantly, it fills within one beat. If you look at it again, it fills within one beat. So it fills very quickly. For those two features, filling quickly within one beat and as dense as the ascending aorta, probably a little more dense, that's at least a three plus aortic insufficiency. So that's severe AI, okay? Another hint here or another technical aspect, when you're doing this, you want to do your injection what view, what view is this, by the way? Anybody can tell? It looks like AB or shallow RAO. Uh, yes, it's uh, close to AP, but it is, it is more of an LAO view. It's shallow LAO, but it is an LAO view. What it is, because remember, RAO, in RAO, your aorta will be here, and the this aorta, the aorta in RAO is here, and then the, des the aortic arch is there, and you have a descending aorta this side, like here, aorta, then descending aorta, ascending aorta, and descending aorta. Whereas in um, LAO, which is the view we use to engage the coronary, you have descending is here, ascending is there. So this is an LAO view. And the reason, usually for aortic insufficiency, I use LAO view, the reason I want to see the whole aorta spread out, okay? And I want to be able to measure that ascending aorta, which I did, by the way. Remember, AI is frequently associated with ascending aortic dilatation. It could be the cause of it, or it frequently is the result of it, or it could be just a perpetrator of it. Regardless, I like to see that ascending aorta. I don't want it to be... Um, potentially overlap with the descending aorta. So I like to open it and I like to do an LAO view. So for AI, particularly for that ascending aorta, I usually do LAO view, okay? Uh, so that's one hint. Now the volume for AI, same thing. You have to inject a big volume and sustain it. And it has to be, you're filling the aorta. It has to be an even bigger volume than what you do with MR. So what I do here, I usually do uh, 50 to 60 milliliters of contrast, and I use 20 milliliters per second. So 20 milliliters per second for a total of 50 to 60 milliliters. You have to fill those structures to be able to compare them. Keep in mind those structures are dilated, so you need a big volume to fill them. The more dilated the structure, the bigger volume you need to fill them. This is the same with MR. Again, but MR, the number was slower, 13 milliliter per second for a total of 50 milliliters. So keep those numbers in mind, very important for when you do those, okay? Another thing to notice here, this is by Caspid Valve. Interestingly here, this is again, LAO view. So normally you see right cusp and left cusp. Interestingly here, the jet, those right and left cusp are stuck together. There is, there is nothing moving here. You see the right and left curvature. It's hard for you to appreciate, but the jet is coming more posteriorly. This right and left cusp are fused and the jet is coming posteriorly from the non-coronary cusp, between the non-coronary and that fused cusp. So those two jet are, those two cusps are fused. And it's mostly that right portion of that cusp that is dilated. It measured uh, four centimeter by uh, iorthography. Okay. Um, so those are some of the hints. Any questions? 
All right, I want to explain quickly how to access the left ventricle. So one technique to access the left ventricle, even though I image frequently in RAO, I like to access the left ventricle in LAO, simply because LAO spreads out the right and left cusp and behind them the non-coronary cusp. There are two major techniques. One technique is to use the pigtail catheter and use the pigtail itself to fall on the left ventricle. I usually advance a pigtail. I put a wire in it all the way, not out, but all the way to the tip to stiffen it. And I try to make it loop. And when it loops, I hope it will fall. The technical hint here is don't loop it. The biggest issue is that sometimes and frequently it loops on that right cusp, which is the lower cusp or the non-coronary cusp, and it gets stuck in it you have to try to free it from that right cusp. So as you're pulling to loop it, maybe pull it back also, pull it up a little bit, just so it overlaps with the hole in between. That's one reason I like to use LAO view to engage because it allows me to estimate where is the right and left cusp and to aim in between. So I try to loop it somewhat in between the right and left cusp. And at some point, it will fall. That's the hope. Now, if it doesn't fall, you pull back and restart. And as you're pulling back, give it a slight clock or counter clock. Let's say for you to make it simple, slight counter clock, and sometimes it will fall as you're pulling back. So that's one technique. Sometimes it falls halfway in, that arm falls in, but the tip is still in the aorta. This is very easy. If this happens, just advance the wire and the whole system will fall in. The other technique that I like that we use more often these days is not using the pigtail, is to just use a standard catheter. And that technique is particularly useful when you're not aiming to do an LV gram, you're using a tiger catheter to access the LV and measure LVDP, or when you're accessing severe aortic stenosis, okay? So, this is a standard catheter, typically, for example, a Judkins right catheter. You use that catheter. So in, when you're doing that technique, you have to access the left ventricle with the wire, not with the catheter. So when you're doing a pigtail, you try to access and loop and push the pigtail itself. But when you're using a standard catheter, you cross into the ventricle with a wire, then you track the catheter over the wire, okay? All you do with the catheter is direct it. You start torquing slightly the catheter and pulling it up to direct it into that hole between the left and right cusp. Then you push the wire and you track the catheter over it. So what you do, you direct, you push the wire. If the wire doesn't go, you pull it back. You give a slight torque to the catheter and maybe slight pull and push. You redirect, you redirect and push the wire, then pull it back. So you keep redoing it. Torque the catheter, advance the wire. Retorque the catheter, re-advance the wire until the wire gets in, okay? One mistake that we do commonly, especially from radial, where we have a problems getting into the LV, is that our catheter is stuck in the right cusp and we keep advancing that wire into the right cusp and looping it in the right cusp. You have to try to free that catheter up and advance the wire in between the right and left cusp. So whenever you're struggling with accessing the left ventricle, it's often time that you're looping low in the right or non-coronary cusp. You need to get up a little bit, free it and re-advance. You try different catheter torques and heights. This is another uh, example of various anatomies of the aortic cusp. Those are interesting because you're not seeing the aortic cusp, you're imagining it. So you need to kind of be able to imagine the anatomy. This is particularly relevant in aortic stenosis. And based on the anatomy of the ascending aorta and the anatomy of that cusp area, depending how straight, horizontal, or vertical it is, and most often it is close to number three in most elderly anatomy, your anatomy is mostly number three. Your aorta is elongated and flat and the cusps are vertical. So depending on that shape, you decide what catheter I use. Typically, uh, frequently an amplatz left is the best catheter to access the left ventricle in severe aortic stenosis or in those patients with elongated aorta. 
amplitude left will sit here and will aim you to the hole in between the right and left cusp, okay? So I'll show you some examples here, okay? Normally, by the way, for non-AS cases, I use it just a standard wire, J wire. For AS cases, we use a straight tip soft wire, but straight tip so that it can cross that. Uh, you don't want a J when you have severe AS, okay? So this is an example here of a patient with aortic stenosis, okay? So I tried to cross blindly for a couple of minutes, I couldn't. So in that case, I, I'm using an amplitude left. A reminder, this is a catheter that has that big butt with a duck shape. So I'm using an amplitude left, I couldn't cross. I, it's always important at this point to do an uh, aortic root shot, not much contrast, 10 cc's, just to get an idea of the anatomy. So now I know the anatomy and I know the angle and I know where to aim to. So using this as my guide, so I put it as my guiding image as a reference, and now I start maneuvering with the wire using this as my guide. So look here. So I start aiming my wire. And you can see, and it went in, okay? So I'm aiming my wire to that area. At one point, it will loop in the right cusp. You'll see it here. Here I'm hitting, here I'm looping in the right cusp, then I went into it. But the idea is that I know the anatomy, so it wasn't hard. So after I got that wire in the left ventricle, I chased it, tracked the catheter over it in the left ventricle. Then we typically exchange for what we call a double lumen pigtail. Okay, so I put that catheter in, but that catheter is not great. It's very irritating. It pokes the ventricle and creates ectopy. So you have to exchange. So we advance this and you advance the catheter. Then you put an exchange length uh, J wire that is friendly to the ventricle. Then you exchange for another catheter such as an exchange length uh, pigtail catheter, uh, su such as, sorry, double lumen pigtail catheter to measure the LV aorta simultaneous gradient. 